Right, so as for the primary structure, we need to know the amino acid sequence. So in 1953, there was two major discoveries. Uh, let's, let's put 1953. So that was really crucial or important for in the history of biochemistry. So in 1953, uh, James Watson, James Watson and uh, Francis Creek, Creek. Deduce this two person deduce the double helical structure of DNA and proposed a structural basis uh, for precise replication. And in that same year, Frederick Sanger, in this year as well, Frederick Sanger worked out the sequence of amino acid residue in a polypeptide chain of hormone insulin. So this and the hormone. So what he did, he worked out the sequence of amino acid residues in the polypeptide chain of hormone insulin. And this guys uh, deduced the double helical structure of DNA. There is, I will write it here. Deduced the double helical structure of DNA. All right. So this is how the sequence of amino acids come in the that comes in the history by discovering like people started discovering the amino acid sequence of polypeptide chain and like uh, it quickly become evident that the nucleotide sequence in a DNA and the amino acid sequence in proteins were uh, somehow related. So the amino acid sequence of protein are now most often derived indirectly from the DNA sequence and in genome. Uh, databases so but however there are different techniques that uh, uh, biochemists use to derive the uh, amino acid sequences that some are traditional method of, of polypeptide sequencing still command an important place in protein chemistry on your screen you will see the sequence for the hormone insulin that has been discovered by Frederick Sanger right so we'll just go through a few of the methods that how uh, in protein chemistry, this uh, polypeptide sequencing is recognized. But nowadays, the sequence of protein can usually be predicted from the sequence of gene coding, gene encoding it information. That information is now readily available in the ever-growing genomic databases, right? But the the oldest method was the, by Frederick Sanger, and uh, so in that method, like what happened the First, what they do, the amino terminal, that is like, for example, let's see, I will just draw a simple little diagram. Right, just for an example, this are two amino acids. Like for example, just imagine like this is the whole polypeptide chain and that's in a quaternary structure or like in a three dimensional structure. And so what in this method do, the first the amino terminal, so this is the amino terminal, that is amino acid residues was first labeled and its identity was determined. So if, if this is a long chain, for example, so first only this portion of the amino terminal is determined. Then the amino terminal of alpha amino group can be labeled with, so this can be labeled or deal with uh, F, D, and B. Right, so, so what, after determining the amino terminal, this will react with, now they will react with F, D, and B. So that means, that means one, Fluoro two four di nitro benzene. Right, so this is FDNB. So there are other reagents as well beside the FDNB. So it can be like densyl chloride. All right, it can be react with densyl chloride or dapsyl chloride as well. 
Okay, so any of this, so that it will react after determining the amino terminal, it will react with the FD and B. And after reacting well, so then we'll know like this, the first is the glycine is at the amino terminus, for example. Like glycine is at the amino terminus. So after reacting with this FD and B, so then what we'll do, determine the, we'll determine the amino acid content, like what's the amino acid content, that is by a, acid hydrolysis so after determining uh, the amino acid contained what we'll do we'll select a splitting reagent so these are the splitting reagent or there are different kind of that a splitting reagent are based on the presence of target amino acids in the protein so this is the long protein for example and the uh, splitting reagent will be based on the which amino acid we have to target for example the splitting what we'll do if this is a long chain of amino acid or sorry a protein or a polypeptide then we'll break into a small polypeptide chains like for example with trypsin this is there uh, this is trypsin is a one of the splitting reagent all right after splitting into small polypeptide chain what we will do we will sequence each polypeptide right so all right so this is the first process then after react this will react with this after reacting will uh, determine amino acid content all right after determining the amino acid content we'll select uh, splitting reagent based on presence of based on presence of target amino acid acid and protein so after that step what we'll do we will split this into a split into a smaller poly peptide chain so there will be a from suppose it's just one polypeptide chain will break into like two three four polypeptide chain two three or four or whatever the size is the smaller polypeptide chain and then we'll sequence those polypeptide chain so sequence the smaller polypeptide so after doing this we just need to determine the order we just need to determine the order of polypeptide like which peptide is at the amino terminus and which is at the carboxylic terminus so this is just the oldest method that was done by Fadric right so this was one of the method uh, for the amino acid sequences there are, there is another method that is for chemical sequences so that is a two-step process developed by pair admin so that is known as admin degradation so on your screen you will see uh the the image for this admin degradation how this process work it's a long process but so i will show you here so for example this as simple this is a peptide bond same as that so first we will take under mildly alkaline condition first we'll take this into a basic condition alkaline condition so first step is under the alkaline condition but uh, that will be react with phenyl isothiocyanate first it will react with this that first step uh, first amino terminal amino acid right so it will react with this phenyl isothiocyanate so this first amino acid will be converted because of will be converted into phenyl that you are seeing on your screen thio carba mel all right that is also known as ptc addict right so this 
First amino acid is converted into this derivative, phenylthio carbamyl adder derivative, right? Then after converting this, then what we'll do, so it has this product here, and then there is another amino acid, right? So we will do a second step, all right? So I'll write it here, second step, all right? So after making this, so the peptide bond next to this PTCI that so this second step will be taken or carried out in an anhydrous this will be carried out in anhydrous trifluoroacetic acid so this this was in the alkaline this first step this was in the acid right so the second step for the second amino acid or the peptide bond nearby this derivative will be carried out in an anhydrous trifluoroacetic acid which will remove which will remove one of the amino terminal amino acid as so the second amino acid terminal will be removed as an anilo nilino thai thiazolinone derivative right so that is too long so this the first derivative we find get this derivative and the second we will get this derivative right so this derivatized amino acid is extracted with the organic solvents and then converted to more stable phenyl thiohydine thion so this derivatives then will be extracted with organic solvents so I'll write it down here organic solvents to the more stable state so this will be converted to more stable state that is phenyl thiohydantoin. I'm sorry. So it will be phenyl thiohydantoin derivative. Alright, so that will be converted into this derivative by treatment with aqueous acid and then identified and so this will be treated with an aqueous acid and then the sequence will be identified so the use of sequential reaction carried out under the first basic condition and then the acidic condition provides means of controlling the entire process so this each reaction with amino terminal amino acid can go essentially to the completion without affecting any uh, any of other peptide bonds in the this peptide chain so the process is repeated until typically as many as 40 sequential amino acid residues are identified. All right, so this was the second method for the determining the sequence of amino acids. So the uh, to determine sequence of uh, large proteins, early developers of sequencing protocols had to devise method to eliminate disulfide bonds and to split proteins precisely into a smaller poly polypeptide, right? So there are disulfide bond as well, that is in methionine and cysteine. So two approaches to irreversible breakage of disulfide bond were outlined. So that is called enzymes called proteases catalyze the hydrolytic splitting of peptide bond. So some proteases uh, split only the peptide bond adjacent to the particular amino acid residue and thus fragment a polypeptide chain in a more predictable and reproducible way. There are few chemical reagents also split the peptide bond adjacent to specific residues. So like like these are the splitting reagents or you can call the chemical reagents so some of the chemical reagents are like per very particular and they will just split the peptide bonds adjacent to a specific amino acid for example the digestive enzyme trypsin catalyzes the hydrolysis of only those peptide bond in which the carbonyl group is contributed by either lysine or an arginine residue right so that so they some some of them has really a particular regardless of the length of the amino acid sequence of the chain regardless of the length but the trypsin will only hydrolyze the peptide bond in which the carbonyl group is contributed by either lysine or arginine right so you can see the table that will show you the specificity uh, specificity of some common methods of fragmenting polypeptide chain so on the left side there there is a reagent and on the right side there's a cleavage point or the splitting point so like for example we talked about tri uh, trypsin right so that they just broke uh they split the peptide bond 
with the lysine or arginine though the next one is submaxillary protease so they just go with the arginine all right so we saw the two these two methods so there is also mass spectrometry that offers an alternative method to determine amino acid sequence so this is a modern adaptation rather so mass spectrometry provide an inter important alternative uh, method to sequencing all right so but the mass spectrometry uh, spectrometry is actually used to uh, detect or measure a molecular weights of a protein and that is really in a high accuracy point but can also do much more but the main reason for the mass spectrometry is to detect the molecular weights of protein so what how it goes so the in the mass spectrometry the molecules to be analyzed they are referred to as analytes are first ionized in the vacuum they the molecules are ionized in the vacuum so as they are ionized so they become charged molecules and are introduced into a electric or the magnetic field and their path through the field are function of the mass to charge ratio or called and known as an and mz ratio and so this measured property of ionized species can be used to reduce the mass of the analyte or the molecules that are to be analyzed with very high precision so although the mass spectrometry has been in use for many years it can it could not be applied to a macro molecule such as proteins and nucleic acid why because the mz measurement are made on molecules in a gas phase and the heating or other treatment needed to transfer a macro molecule to the gas phase usually causes rapid decomposition so if the macro molecules are used in the gas phase it will cause a rapid decomposition that why that's why it is not used on the macro molecules such as protein but in 1988 two different techniques were developed to overcome this problem so the first technique was protein the protein are placed in an light absorbing matrix with a short pulse of laser light proteins are ionized first through the laser light and then deabsorbed from the matrix so they are released from the matrix and then introduced into the vacuum system so this process known as matrix this process is known as matrix assisted laser desorption or also known as io ionization mass spectrometry spectrometry or in the short it's known as maldi ms so this is one of the techniques so is name suggest so like first the protein are used in a short pulse of laser light that are proteins are ionized by that and the proteins are then deabsorbed and then introduced into the vacuum system so this process was really successful in for the measuring the mass of wide range of macro molecules so there is a second as well uh, that was also actually successful and in that the macro molecules in a solution are forced directly from the liquid to the gas phase so what they do a solution of analytes is passed through a charged needle that is kept at a high electrical potential dispersing the solution into a fine mist of charged micro droplets so from the liquid it will be go into the micro droplets or gas phases and the solvent surrounding the macro molecules rapidly evaporates leaving only the multiply charged macro molecules ion in the gas phase so this technique is called electrospray electrospray ionization mass spectrometry okay right, this is the second or the short form is esi ms right so this is the second the first in the first step it will, the proteins are first done with the laser light and then it is dissolved from and transferred into the vacuum system and then they their mass is detected and in this first the macromolecules are transferred 
through a charged needle that is kept at a high electrical potential. So what will the solution will be turned into a fine mist of micro droplets. All right, so it will be turned to liquid to the gas phase. So the accurately measured molecular mass of protein is critical to its identification. And once the mass of a protein is accurately known, mass spectrometry is convenient and accurate method for detecting changes in the mass due to presence of bond cofactors or like bond metal ions, covalent bond modification and so on. So the process for determining the molecular mass of protein with this ESIMS, this mass spectrometry is used to determine the molecular weights of the protein or the MZ ratio of the protein. But the mass spectrometry can also be used to sequence short stretches of polypeptide an application that has emerged as an invaluable tool for quickly identifying unknown proteins. So what happens? The sequence information is extracted using a technique that is called how the sequence is extracted. The technique is called tandem mass spectrometry. All right. So why it is called tandem tandem MS? So we'll see that. Okay, so I will draw a figure here, for example, or if you want this, should I remove it, should I remove it? Anyway, okay, I'll just draw a figure here. All right, so we'll draw a figure here, for example, this is a solution, all right? This is a solution. So solution that will contain a protein, containing protein will hydrolyze it to a mixture of shorter peptides. So how this will be hydrolyzed to a mixture of shorter peptide using under the investigation there the protein will be first treated with a protease or a chemical reagent. So I will put here okay, I think you can see this protein. This will be first treated with or hydrolyzed with protease or or any chemical chemical region all right so first it, and then this mixture will be then this mixture is injected into a device so it will be filled in the injection and then there is a device beside this so then this mixture will be injected into a device that is essentially two mass spectrometers. So this is MS1. There is one small thing here. There is another. This is mass spectrometer two. All right. So first the protein or protease is hydrolyzed using the uh, protease or chemical reagent. All right. So in the first pe peptide. So in this first mass spectrometry, this peptide mixture that we are injecting here will be first sorted so that only one of the of the several types of peptide produced by the splitting emerges at the other end of the right. So what will happen? So this mixture will be transferred to this first mass spectrometry and in this uh, the different peptides will be sorted. So I will just put it here like sorting of peptides. So different peptides will be sorted so that only one selected type of peptide will go for the further analysis. All right. And so from this, it will go to this step. Right. So what will happen? So after sorting this peptide, so this will be going from this injected into the first mass spectrometry here there will be a sorting of peptide or like there will be a small peptide breakage so during this small peptide breakage so it will either amino terminus or carboxyl terminus will have any charges as well and this in between is a vacuum chamber vacuum chamber so this after sorting the peptide it will go into this vacuum chamber so or this is called a collision cell so the peptide is further so in this the peptide is further fragmented by high energy impact with a collision gas such as helium or argon helium or argon so this is a vacuum chamber and this is treated with the helium or argon that is bled into the vacuum chamber 
so now each individual peptide is broken in only one place so after this it will go into this so each individual peptide is broken in only one place and on average and although although the breaks are not hydrolytic because usually when the peptide bonds break it is normally hydrolysis but in this it is not hydrolytic but most occur at the peptide bonds right so this is broken in vacuum chamber it is broken into a just single one and then it is transferred to this second mass spectrometry that measures the mz ratio of all the charge fragments that this mass spectrometry will see so this process generate uh, one or more set of peak so that means uh, one set of peak include only the fragments so that the fragments are that are broken down in which the charge the charge was retained on the amino side or the amino terminal side of the broken bonds and another includes only the fragments in which the charge was retained on the carboxylic terminal side of the broken bonds right so for example this is one so the charge will be retained here and this is the same thing on this side the charge will be retained on the carboxylic terminal and then each successive peak in a given set has one less amino acid than the peak before so the difference in the mass from peak to peak identifies the amino acid that was lost in each case thus revealing the sequence so this is how the sequence is revealed of the peptide and the only ambiguities involved is leucine and isoleucine leucine and isoleucine why this two amino acid because this two both have the same mass right so this was the mass spectrometry method so we studied the three methods so they all are helpful for the protein sequence information but the the admin degradation process is sometimes convenient to get sequence information uniquely from the amino terminus of a protein or a peptide but however it is relatively slow and requires a larger sample than does the mass spectrometry so we studied about the different methods of how the biochemist reveals the amino acid sequence so now the small peptides and proteins can be chemically synthesized as well we see the breakdown of peptide bonds but many peptides are potentially useful as a pharmacologic agents and their production is of a considerable commercial importance so there are three ways how they obtain a peptide or how they synthesize a peptide so first is the purification from a tissue that is done there is a genetic engineering as well or direct chemical synthesis and in addition to the commercial application the synthesis of specific peptide portions of a larger protein is an increasingly important tool for study of protein structure and function all right so the peptide can be synthesized chemically as well so now the amino acid sequence provides important biochemical information that we know so the knowledge of sequence of amino acids in a protein can offer insights into a three dimensional structure and its functions cellular location and evolution right so but exactly how the amino acid sequence determine the three dimensional structure is not understood in detail and nor can we always predict function from the sequence it's not always like that like if this is a sequence that the function will be like that it's not always the case so there are certain amino acid sequences serves that serves as a signals that determine the cellular location or chemical modification and half life of a protein like special signal sequences usually at the amino terminus this is the amino terminus are used to target certain proteins only for export from the cell or other proteins are targeted for distribution of uh, distribution to the nucleus or the cell surface so as the cytosol or other cellular locations so each protein functions relies on its three dimensional structure which in turn uh, is large uh, which in turn is determined largely by its primary structure so every protein function relies on its three dimensional structure that in turn is determined largely by its primary structure right so there is the field of molecular evolution that is often traced to amelie zucker candle and linus pauling so their work was in the mid 1960 that has advanced the use of nucleotide 
and protein sequences to explore the evolution how it is evolved so if two organisms are closely related the sequence of their genes and protein should be similar so the sequence increasingly diverge as the evolutionary distance between two organisms increases so the promise of this approach began to realize in 1970 when Carl Woos used ribosomal RNA sequence to define archaea as a group of living organisms distinct from the bacteria and eukarya. But there is another complicating factor in tracing the evolu evolutionary history is the rare transfer of gene or groups of gene from one organism to another. That process is called a horizontal gene transfer process is called horizontal gene transfer so that is the transfer genes may be similar to the genes they were derived from in the original organism whereas most other genes in the same two organism may be only distantly related so the example is of horizontal gene transfer is the recent spread of antibiotic resistance gene in bacterial population right the proteins derived from this transferred gene would not be a good candidate for the study of bacterial evolution because they share only a very limited evolutionary history with their host organism so the study of molecular evolution generally focuses on families closely related proteins so how they study the Molecular evaluation for the closely related protein is like the families cho chosen for analysis have essential function in cellular metabolism that must have been present in the earliest viable cells, thus greatly reducing the chance that they were introducing, they were introduced like recently by horizontal gene transfer. For example, a protein called uh, elongation factor 1 alpha, that is EF. EF1 alpha or elongation factor 1 alpha is involved in the synthesis of protein in all eukaryotes, right? So, but there is a similar protein that is EF2. So, EFTU. So, the similarity in the sequence and the function indicate that EF1 alpha and EFTU are from the members of a family of protein that share a common ancestor. So, the member of protein families are called what the member of protein families are called they are called homologous protein they are sharing the same ancestor homologous protein all right or homologous homologs or homologs all right so the concept of homolog can be further refined what we can do if two protein in a family that is two homologous are present in the same species they are referred to as a paralog, right? So if two protein present in the same species, so this were like different species, but in the same species, they are referred to as a paralog. Paralog, that is same species, right? And homologs from different species are called orthologs. So the process of tracing evolution involves First, identifying the suitable families of homologous protein and then using them to reconstruct evolutionary paths. Right, so this, this was just for knowledge, but like protein sequences are rich source of information about protein structure and function, as well as the evolution of life on Earth. So the sophisticated methods are being developed to trace evolution by analyzing the slow changes in amino acid sequences of homologous proteins. Right, so this was the protein structure and function for with the primary structure. All right, All right. So we went through the primary structure and how in the primary structure, how this amino acid sequences are are find out and are discovered like in different methods. Like in 1953, the James Watson deduced the double helical, but in the same year, Frederick Sanger uh, determined the hormone insulin sequence and the method that he developed to determine the sequence is this then there is the second step the second method so that is here second method by uh admin de admin process or de admin degradation process so this is in two steps and there is mass spectrometry as well 
so these are different kinds of methods all right thank you guys for watching and don't forget to subscribe the channel we'll see with the three-dimensional structure in the next video thank you